It's now my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker this evening, Dr. Irvi Shah, an assistant attending in my Loma service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and an assistant professor of medicine at Weill Cornell. Dr. Shah also just spoke this past weekend at the IMF Support Group Leaders Summit, where I'm thrilled to share with you that she received a well-deserved standing ovation. So Dr. Shah, now that I've embarrassed you a little bit, would you kindly begin? Thank you so much, Robin. It's great to be here with you all. And thank you for sharing this enthusiasm for this topic, um, you know, late in the evening for some of you. I really appreciate it. So, well, um, these are my disclosures. Just a little background about me. I went to medical school in India and um, out there, uh, similar to most medical schools across the world, I would say, I learned very little about nutrition. And as I saw patients there, I, it was very rare or almost never that I ever spoke about nutrition or thought about lifestyle factors at that time. And then I went to residency at Tufts in Boston. And very similarly, we treated a lot of advanced patients with a lot of comorbidities. We had advanced heart failure patients, advanced cancer, renal disease, all of those things. And the same thing, I did not once think about the, the side, meaning, of course, we referred patients to nutritionists, but I did not think about it from a, a physician perspective. Um, when I went to fellowship at Montefiore in New York for my hematology oncology fellowship, I was treating all types of cancer at that time. And again, very similarly, we never really learned much about nutrition and cancer. However, in 2016, at the end of my first year, I developed Hodgkin's lymphoma and I was a patient at um, that time. During that time and through my treatment, I had lots of family and friends telling me um, you know, maybe try this, eat this food, do that. And I'm sure all of you get this happening to you all the time. And so I felt at that time, why don't we have oncologists talking about this and what about all the evidence? And so at that time, I decided to um, look more into all of this and started reading up about this as a side hobby. What ended up happening is that um, with that information, um, I found that actually there was a lot of information available. It's just that patients did not know about it often. And so I started reading about it and felt like I would like to end up doing research in this area eventually. And so when I started as faculty at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I started with a pilot study and I asked my chief and team at that time, can we start? Do it, can I start a study in this space? And he was very supportive. And then one study led to the next. And now, we have a uh, um, program in nutrition looking at nutrition, the microbiome and metabolism, specifically in myeloma, but also looking at it for other cancers slightly as well. So I'm going to talk about how lifestyle research and its implementation is an unmet need. The few things I'll talk about is how comorbidities affect cancer, and I'll specifically focus on obesity and diabetes since they're so common. And then we'll talk about nutrition research and things that we have done so far and what is also available by others. And then just some practical tips um, and some myths around nutrition. So we do know, and this is exciting time for you know overall myeloma care, that most patients are living much longer than ever before. And this is so different from what I even studied in medical school. However, there is an opportunity to improve outcomes and quality of life uh, further with dietary and lifestyle interventions. And you know that's important that we study it as well. So while this is an example from colorectal cancer, I wanted to discuss the importance of the interplay between genes and lifestyle. So what you see here is that patients were divided into a healthy lifestyle score, intermediate or unhealthy. The healthy is in white, and the black is the unhealthy lifestyle score. And what you see is also they divided patients into high genetic risk, so bad genes versus good genes or low genetic risk. And you can see in the right-hand side of the slide that the high genetic risk with bad lifestyle actually had 9.9 .9 or almost 10% risk of developing um, colorectal cancer, whereas 
the, the same high risk genes with healthy lifestyle and white was about 5.5%, very similar to the intermediate risk genetic category. So while genes are important, and I know we focus on you know genetic risk, high risk, standard risk, I think lifestyle can play a role. And it seems like in this study, and I know this is colorectal cancer because we don't have one in myeloma, but uh, for the high risk patients, actually lifestyle uh, changes made much more of a difference than in the standard risk. Um, here is an example of a patient who I've taken care of previously. And what you can see is there are multiple, this patient had multiple medical issues separate from the myeloma. And you can imagine that that would make it challenging to be able to treat the myeloma and give them the best therapy possible. What I've marked in green are the things that I think would be important and possible to um, you know, uh, impact through lifestyle changes and could have been prevented. Uh, because of these reasons, the patient was not a candidate for stem cell transplantation, CAR T cell therapy, clinical trials, and even intensive chemotherapy, and thus had a decreased overall survival. Another patient um, had IgG kappa myeloma, got the six cycles of standard chemotherapy, and followed by lenalidomide maintenance. The patient achieved a complete response and was doing really well, but you can see in their past medical history had a lot of cardiac um, um, risk factors and um, cardiac disease. How unfortunately, this patient, while the myeloma was in remission, died of a cardiac arrest. What I'm trying to bring to you with these two examples is that one, whether we try to, it's not only just treating the myeloma that we should focus on, but also all the other medical conditions surrounding the myeloma therapy, because many of our patients are no longer dying of their myeloma because we have such effective therapies, and many are dying of other reasons. And so if we really want to live long, we need to focus on these things as well. So um, when we think about the comorbidity of BMI or body mass index, Extreme BMI, meaning um, very high BMI or even very low BMI, is associated with um, worse outcomes. So what you can see is that MGUS, um, a high BMI is associated with a higher risk of MGUS, and also twice as likely for the precursor states of MGUS and smoldering myeloma to progress to myeloma. Um, also, there's an increased, uh, patients who are, um, who lose weight unintentionally due to a myeloma diagnosis are likely to do worse. So it's important that you know when a patient has myeloma, we don't want them losing weight unintentionally, but if it's planned with eating well and healthy nutrition, then that's, that's a good thing. So you can see here that we published a review on obesity and uh, myeloma, and you can see there are multiple different mechanisms around which obesity can affect risk of development of myeloma. And there, a fun fact was that when we were trying to write this paper, there were so many articles that we could not even cite them all into the paper because of the limit of citations. Um, when you look at this figure, what we did is we looked at over a thousand patients in the Compass Registry, and what we saw was patients who had very extreme BMI, either underweight or severely obese, tended to do a bit worse than patients who had the normal BMI. And what we did recently with two fellows, um, uh, MSK uh, Ross and Ram, we looked at weight changes. And what you see is that patients who are weight stable, um, for my, this is patients with myeloma during induction therapy. And most patients during that time really don't lose much weight. So when they start chemotherapy to the end of chemotherapy is what we're looking at. And you can see the majority of patients are weight stable. There are some patients who lost weight and there are some who gained weight. But what you see is that the patients who lost weight are more, most likely to be the overweight or obese patients. And the ones who gained weight are more likely to be the normal or underweight patients. So that suggests that it is not um, a concerning issue. Weight loss is a, a less frequent issue that we see with myeloma. Not that we don't see it, but we see it less frequently during the induction treatment. Um, the next one I'd like to talk about is diabetes, and diabetes with, is, has been associated with increased risk of cancer 
blood cancer and myeloma. The risk is small for myeloma, but it's much more for other cancers such as pancreatic cancer. And we do know that patients who get diagnosed with diabetes within the six months of diagnosis, often we find the diabetes sooner. And that may be due to just going to a doctor more often. But um, what about after a myeloma diagnosis? So we recently, this was just published this month, we looked at um, over 5,000 patients and saw looked at how many patients had diabetes versus not. And we saw that diabetes was more prevalent in the black population, double than the white. But also, diabetic patients, as you can see with the blue um, line, was associated with worse survival compared to non-diabetic. Uh, we also looked at this in a mouse model, and you can see that um, in the mouse model with type 2 diabetes, there was faster progression of the myeloma and, and more, more rapid um, you know, growth of tumors as well. So next part I'd like to talk about is nutrition. And while um, you know, the first thing we did is we started with surveying patients a few years back to see what are the interests of patients and what are their needs. And overwhelmingly, we saw that patients have questions around diet and nutrition, and that if their oncologist gives them recommendations, they do attempt to follow it. And um, many do say that their oncologist doesn't address it. What I was surprised to see was that there was an improvement in healthier food intake by patients on their own and a reduction in red meat and junk food on their own. While this is self-reported, it is still encouraging to see that patients make changes on their own. These are the World Cancer Research Fund guidelines, and I'm not sure if you've seen them before, but in our survey, only a third of patients knew about these guidelines. And what you can see is six out of 10 of these guidelines are actually around um, healthy lifestyle changes in terms of survivorship and even in risk of cancer. It, it's a great website to look at if you wanna know details about individual food and food that fight cancer or food that to limit and avoid. And what you can see is all the foods that fight cancer are pretty much plant-based foods. Um, now we go on to dietary patterns and myeloma risk, and these are just a few of the large studies that have been done in myeloma. What you can see here is the EPIC Oxford study. This was done in 2014, and while there were only 65 myeloma cases in this large population of over 60,000, because myeloma is a rare disease, you can see that the, the people who were classified as vegans or vegetarians had a 77% lower likelihood of developing myeloma than meat eaters. We also see in this study, which is looking at another large population of over 150,000 individuals who developed, there were 400 cases of myeloma, 423. You can see that if before their diagnosis of myeloma, they had healthier dietary patterns, they were 15 to 24% lower risk of death from myeloma. And if they had unhealthy dietary patterns, they had a 16 to 24% higher risk of death from myeloma. Most recently, um, with fellows Richard Parikh and um, our dietitian Francesca, what I did, what we did was look at the NIH ARP cohort, and this study is the largest to date, looking at myeloma risk with pre-diagnosis dietary patterns, and we had over 1,300 myeloma cases in this data set. And what you can see is that a higher healthy plant-based diet index was associated with a 15% reduced risk of myeloma development. And the way the plant-based diet index was calculated was that patients who ate higher amount of plant-based foods got a higher score, and those that ate lower amounts got a lower score. Um, another study we looked at um, was the NHANES study looking at uh, MGUS and um, controls. And what you can again see here is that patients who um, were eating more whole grains, fruits, and vegetables had a lower risk of developing MGUS by about 20 to 30 percent. And those who had intake of sugar sweetened beverages uh, had a 30 to 40 percent or maybe even 50 percent increased risk of MGUS. So we do know that diet can affect risk of cancer, and it may not be the only thing. I know there are other things like environmental factors, lifestyle, other things, but just now we're focusing on nutrition. So just some of the different mechanisms around which diet may affect cancer. What you can see is that 
um, a plant forward diet is rich in fiber that improves intestinal transit time. So you don't have food sitting um, in the bowels long, but you also have it high flavonoid intake or plant chemicals that have anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory effect, improvement in weight. Um, patients who have more of a fiber-rich diet tend to have a more healthy BMI, less inflammation, less insulin resistance. And so these are some of the mechanisms. And um, what you can see here is we published a paper this year looking at more into the details of how these mechanisms of how diet may affect the microbiome and the immune system and therefore may possibly outcomes. We do need to do more research and trials into this space to know for sure how it affects these myeloma specific outcomes. But we do have some idea which I will share now in the next few slides. So when we were talking about microbiome, I think it's important for me to give you a little bit of an overview. And um, just remember, we are more microbiome cells than human cells in our body. Um, and so it's important to feed the microbiome and not just what we want. Um, and um, you can see here that the microbiome is important for many, many different health and disease factors. And you can see all of them here and how it affects not just um, the, it affects the immune system, inflammation, and a lot of different health and disease aspects. So we know that there are factors that affect the microbiome and immune response. There are things that are not in our control, you know, our age, our gender, our race, genetics, infections, vaccination, um, where we live the cancer, but there are things in our control such as the nutrition, um, healthy BMI, diabetes, physical activity, improving sleep quality, stress, and um, smoking alcohol, drugs, avoiding those things, and even medications that are not necessary, which are not necessary, maybe avoiding. Um, so we do know that, you know, I'm just going over some terminology that I will discuss in the next few slides. But what, when we talk about gut microbiome diversity, we're talking about the variety of different bacteria in the microbiome. And the higher the variety, meaning think of a rainforest with many different species of um, birds, animals, trees, things like that, that's a very healthy ecosystem. We want the same thing in the, the, the microbiome with many different species. Um, this, these bacteria make something called short-chain fatty acids. And amongst the short-chain fatty acids, butrate, propionate, and acetate are some of them. Butrate has been known to be associated with anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory properties. And um, it's, it, there's data around that as well, and we'll talk about it. And the bacteria that make this are the healthier bacteria sometimes classified as butrate producers. Um, so I talked about microbiome diversity. These are two studies from MSK and co my colleagues at MSK. And what you can see here is that higher diversity, meaning variety of the microbes, is associated with longer time in remission uh, after um, transplant in that first figure to your left. And then you can see um, overall survival is also better in the figure to the right top hand corner. What about immune system and what about infection? And now that we are going into winter with the flu season and COVID increased risk, I just wanted to talk about two studies around diet and COVID risk. And what you can again see, the theme is similar, but this is a study looking at frontline workers from six countries, and they classified them into different dietary patterns based on their food intake. And they classified them into plant-based diets and then low-carb or high-protein diets. And what you can see is that the plant-based diet actually had a 73% lower odds of moderate to severe COVID-19 compared to the high-protein, low-carb diets. Um, this is another study of diet and COVID severity, and this was with over 5,000 participants. And the same thing, they calculated this healthy plant-based diet index similar to what we did for myeloma risk. And they showed that people who have the higher score in the plant-based diet index were actually associated with a lower risk and lower severity of COVID. So now let me go on to and discuss a little bit of, you know, how do we study um, diet along with drugs in the prevention, in the treatment, and in the survivorship setting for cancer 
and um, what we've done so far and what, you know, just some examples from other researchers as well. So in the prevention setting, you know, before cancer develops and we have this opportunity in um, myeloma is we have the opportunity to understand MGAS and small ring myeloma and is it possible in patients, we do know that genomic alterations do increase with time with MGAS and small ring myeloma. Uh, but we also know that there's progressive immune dysfunction, meaning that the immune system um, gets further and further dysfunctional over time as we know we prog as the disease progresses. So is it possible that with dietary and lifestyle changes, we could help maybe slow this progression um, down for some patients? And since this has never been studied before, we decided to do a study looking at this because we do know that MGAS and smoldering myeloma patients with an elevated BMI are twice as likely to progress to myeloma. So can we tilt the scale for myeloma development with uh, lifestyle changes? And this was a pilot study looking at 20 participants. And um, what you see is we gave patients three months of a whole food, meaning a fiber-rich plant-based diet through a company called Plantable. And then we provided nutrition coaching for six months and followed them for over a year. What you can see here is that um, there is a, a good distribution of different BMI categories, though we enroll only patients with an elevated BMI. What you can also see is that only three patients dropped out during the intervention, suggesting that this was feasible for most patients to do. And um, we had 18 patients who finished a year on the study. What you can see here is the compliance to the diet or the adherence. And um, at baseline, before the intervention, the patients were eating only 20% of their calories from unprocessed uh, plant-based foods, meaning high fiber rich foods. And uh, on the intervention, this improved to about 90%. And it stayed high even a year after close to 70%. The same thing as you can see for dietary fiber intake, and the yellow line kind of shows you where we would like the recommended daily allowance for fiber or what should uh, most people eat. And at, at the, during the intervention, we were able to help patients reach uh, over this uh, line. And despite having patients eat to satiety, meaning eat till they were full and we never calorie restricted them, there was a calorie restriction on its own because high fiber foods fill you up and then you don't need as many calories. Um, what you can also see here is that we looked at quality of life. And um, while this is an overall healthy population, because this is MGUS and smoldering myeloma patients, you can see that patients had an improvement in their global health status, just overall health and well-being, their shortness of breath and fatigue, all of these things improved on the study. What you can also see here is that we looked at changes in weight uh, and changes in um, um, different like LDL cholesterol, insulin resistance. And what you can see is that patients had a reduction in their BMI by about 8% at the end of 12 weeks, and this was maintained to a year out as well. Um, there was an about a 30, 30 point reduction in their LDL cholesterol for those who had an elevated cholesterol and an improvement in insulin resistance despite eating more carbs than ever because these were all complex carbs and not refined carbs. You can see here that gut microbiome diversity also improved and the butyrate producers or the healthy bacteria also improved. Additionally, we looked at um, changes in BMI, uh, looked at two specific patient examples here. And you can see that this patient had um, a, a um, reduction in their BMI that they maintained after the intervention too. This patient had type 2 diabetes on insulin for over 30 years before going on the study and was able to stop insulin within a month on the study and has not started it back again since two years out of the study. What you can also see is it, um, at the bottom of the slide, the brown line shows you their M spike trajectory or the way it was changing over time before the study um, um, intervention. And the T line is on the interventions looking like it may have slowed down a little bit. We saw a similar finding with this patient where you can also see that it has slowed down a little bit at the bottom. 
You can also see that this patient's kidney function, looking at the left-hand bottom corner, where there is an improvement in um, the, the, uh, the kidney function or stabilization, where it was really worsening over time before that. So what we do see is that for these two patients, and I know this is a small study and we're only showing you two examples, so we really need more data, but you can see that for these two patients, there may have been a slowing of their disease, which was progressing through the intervention. Um, this is a patient who was on the study and before the study, and this is after the study. Um, and you can see that the patient had an improvement in just their outlook to life. This patient was in their 70s, so it's really never too late to make changes. Um, this is the post-intervention survey. We surveyed over um, about four, we surveyed all the patients on the study. We've gotten 14 responses so far. And what we do see is that there is an improvement in um, body weight, diabetes. Um, what you see in green is patients saying that this improved for them. There was also an improvement in anxiety and depression, which um, is, is not showing up in the slide formatting just now. Um, what you can also see is that patients reported the intervention to be easy to follow, and all of them said they would sign up again if we asked them to, suggesting you know that they, they found this beneficial. There was also an improvement in an average savings of about $62 for four patients who managed to stop some medications on the study. And this is a patient's you know, quote saying that this helped them maintain their weight and feel good with more energy. So with that, we have the Nutrivention 3 trial that is enrolling. This study is enrolling at MSK in New York City and at any of our regional sites around New York and New Jersey. Anybody can participate from across the United States, but the patient would have to come to, to MSK for about six visits spread across 12 months or over a year. So as long as somebody is willing to travel for six visits, we're happy to have you on the study as long as you have MGAS or smoldering myeloma, and then we'd have to check for eligibility. This is another study in case you know, you're interested and you have smoldering myeloma, but you do not live um, in a place or a way you have to travel six times to um, New York. Um, in this study, what we do have is that the patients can be anywhere across the country, and as long as they have smoldering myeloma and are not on treatment, they can um, sign up for this study. And what we're doing is it's a very short intervention, and patients can do this from their uh, home, and they just ship us. We ship them, and we do all of the intervention virtually, and we ship them the intervention, and then they ship us back stool samples. This is a study only looking at microbiome. Um, now, we talked about, uh, you know, examples in the prevention setting on how maybe there is a signal or we should be looking more into how diet and lifestyle changes could delay cancer development. But now what about in the treatment setting? Could, with the treatments and therapies that we have, uh, a dietary intervention really um, improve outcomes for patients and improve time in remission or survival even and quality of life? While we don't have data in myeloma yet, and I'm hoping that will change soon, uh, what you can see here is that patients um, in this acute lymphoblastic leukemia study, there were only 40 patients newly diagnosed. For a month on the intervention, they were asked to um, eat better based on the USDA my plate or traffic light suggestions, meaning foods to eat and avoid basically eating a healthier diet. And um, they saw that there was an improvement in insulin resistance, very similar to what we saw in our pilot study. But they also looked at MRD negativity or the rate of you know, complete remission or response. And what they saw was that patients who actually were on the intervention tended to have a higher rate of uh, response or MRD negativity compared to those who were um, in, in a historical co co control, meaning the, a population who didn't have this intervention. While it's not a perfect study because it's not a randomized study, they are doing a randomized study to look into this. And I think you know that's something we need in myeloma too. Um, dietary fiber, this is in melanoma, skin cancer. But again, I think it's interesting because this is around immune therapies and we also are using immune therapies for myeloma, uh, but different kinds. These are immune checkpoint inhibitors. And you can see in the red line is that patients who had sufficient fiber intake 
actually without probiotics had the longest survival probability compared to those who had insufficient fiber intake or who were um, sufficient fiber with probiotics. And this is again a very similar study again in melanoma or skin cancer and those who were eating a healthier diet with these um, um, whole grains, fruits, nuts, vegetables and fish had an increased likelihood of an overall response rate and a 12 month progression free survival as well. What about it in the treatment setting? I thought this is a very important study that you all would have questions around is what about post transplant and the neutropenic diet, you know, um, that restrictive diet where you're not allowed to eat fresh food and fresh vegetables. This study was actually presented at ASH last year, and I was really excited to see it, and it's now even published. But what they did is it was a randomized phase three trial, and they had patients um, eat either, um, a, a, they divided patients post-transplant into either eating a non-restrictive diet, and in the non-restrictive diet, they allowed fresh fruit and vegetables as long as, of course, it was washed well and clean. And in the protective diet, they said all foods need to be cooked to more than 80 degrees Celsius and um, thick peel, peeling the fruit and things like that. And what you can see is that there was really no difference in infection in those with a non-restrictive diet versus the protective diet. And um, there was actually in the restrictive diet more likelihood of weight loss in those patients. So, and quality of life too was affected by the restrictive diet, suggesting that we should no longer be telling patients to not eat fresh fruits and vegetables post-transplant, but suggesting that it's more important that they really wash the vegetables well, but it, it would be okay to eat it as long as they're eating it at home or thinking about it that way. So now we can talk about in the survivorship space or how do we think about it, you know, post-induction therapy or chemotherapy, how do patients um, handle it after they finish their chemotherapy? Do we think that diet and lifestyle changes could improve time to first relapse or improve even um, time in remission for some patients and maybe um, likelihood of cure for some. And so while this is not an interventional study, meaning we were just observing and we did not ask patients to change their diet or anything, this was a study done by me and colleagues at MSK, including Dr. Lesokin uh, and Dr. McLachlan. And what you can see here is that we had patients with myeloma on lenalidomide maintenance therapy post their induction. We calculated some dietary scores like healthy eating index, meaning a higher score means a healthier diet looked at flavonoids, and we also looked at the microbiome and outcomes. And if you probably all know about sustained MRD negativity, but MRD negativity means the likelihood of being, like it means being in complete remission or no evidence of disease in the bone marrow. And uh, what you can see, and when we talk about sustained MRD negativity, we're talking about two time points, one year apart. So that's kind of where we mean like long-term staying in remission. And what you can see here is we saw that the patients who had higher stool diversity, higher butrate producers, higher stool butrate concentration, were more likely to be sustained MRD negative, as you can see with the teal um, box which is the ones who were, uh, who were sustained MRD negative compared to the purple who were MRD positive. And then we correlated this with diet and you can see that um, patients who had healthier diets around more um, healthy proteins such as plant proteins, seafood proteins were associated with higher butyrate levels and higher sustained MRD negativity. Dietary flavonoids, flavonoids only come from plant foods and phytochemicals were also associated with um, the butyrate levels in the stool. So based on this, you know, what we think is happening is that maybe dietary patterns are affecting the microbiome and through these potential mechanisms are affecting my, myeloma control long-term and uh, could be a potential mechanism. We are trying to study this with this um, ongoing study that's open. It's looking at quality of life between two drugs, lenalidomide and daratumumab in the maintenance setting, but about 15 patients in each arm are also getting the dietary intervention to see if um, you know, there is a difference in terms of how the immune therapy and the microbiome changes take place along with diet as well. 
Now, this is a you know question, a little bit of trivia time. It seems like the slide keeps shifting. This happened even for me before. But what I'm trying to do here is um, look at um, a few questions for you. How much do Americans eat on average? And how much should an American eat? And some examples. And you can maybe put it into the chat box what you think. But um, we know that Americans, on average, have 17 teaspoons of sugar per day. And what is the recommended? Less than six for females and nine for males. And as an example, one um, can of Coke has about 10 teaspoons of sugar. So there's a lot of hidden sugar that we sometimes don't even know that we are um, consuming. What about dietary fiber? And we do know that patients um, who are um, have Americans mostly have about half the fiber intake than what we would expect from um, uh, most patients or what we would want. And what you can see is that it's 10 to 15 grams per day for most Americans. And what is the guidelines is 25 to 38 grams. The same thing for um, one and, and you know just one cup of beans uh, cooked would give you 15 grams of dietary fiber. So that's a very quick way to you know, up that fiber from 10 grams of the average to 25 or 30. We also do know that salt intake, um, uh, if you think about how much Americans eat on average is over three grams of salt a day. But what should be and what the requirements are is less than 2.3 grams. And 70% comes from prepared foods and fast foods and processed foods such as pizzas and things like that. But one of the common sources that we don't think about is chicken because a lot of it is often uh, injected with saline to make it look plumper in the supermarket. Another uh, thing about what about fruits? What do you think that is? And that's actually only um, about uh, 0.9 cups per day is what Americans eat, and we want them to eat about 1.5 or 2 cups. Just one large banana is one cup, so you could very quickly up that number and um, eat you know, one cup of fruit a day. The same thing with vegetables. We're eating like half the amount that should be, and one cup of broccoli um, is only 35 calories. So when you eat plant food, also you, know, you can get full, but you, you may not um, have to worry too much about overeating or too many calories. Uh, same thing with protein. The, this is one, one food group you can see that we as Americans are eating double than we need to, and we still just worry about protein all the time instead of what should be, which is 48 to 72 grams. And one cup of beans, again, can give you 15 grams of protein. So what I would encourage you, of course, this is different for a cancer patient who is undergoing treatment where they might be feeling like they're losing weight or something. Maybe they need a higher amount of protein. But otherwise, for most patients, like I showed you, most patients are stable even during cancer treatment with their weight and may not need that much. So um, this is a, sorry, one second. This is a good infographic, and I just put it here to show you how sugars can be in many different foods hidden, and sometimes you don't even know because it's called by different names, but sugar is sugar. So here are some names where you might see beet sugar or cane syrup or glucose or dextrose or maltose or honey, and all of these things are just different uh, types of sugar. High fructose corn syrup especially also. So what is the fiber gap? And you know this has been published about, but um, I told you the recommended intake of fiber is about 30 grams. And 67% of consumers, you know, basically the US population, 67% believe that they get enough fiber. And I, I um, encourage you all to think about whether you think you get enough. But in reality, really only 5% get enough fiber. So we really have a gap where people think they're getting their fiber, but they're not. And this is something you want to think about in your diet because the fiber is what feeds the microbiome and the microbiome is what maintains a healthy intestinal lining and um, affects the immune system and all of that too. So this is just an example because some people may ask me, how do you get enough fiber? This is just to show you foods that can bring you fiber and how it's very easy on a Western diet to not even meet the fiber requirements of a day because fiber only comes from plant foods and you will not get fiber in any animal-based foods or processed foods. And what you can see here is 
that if a person's on a Western kind of diet, they're not meeting their fiber requirements. And if they are on a high fiber diet and eating mainly plant-based foods, they're meeting and exceeding their fiber requirements. Now you will say, what about protein intake? Because if they're eating mostly plant-based foods, are they getting enough protein? And that's why I wanted to show you the other example, the same foods, but now calculating their protein content. And you can see here that the Western diet may be very high in protein, but that doesn't always mean it's a good thing. High protein also is associated with increased mortality, increased kidney disease, other things like that. So we really want to, you know, maintain protein in within the normal range. And you can see that the five high fiber diet, a lot of the foods that you may not think have protein, such as broccoli, also have some protein there. Um, and the only one more thing I'd mention on this slide is that the recommended daily intake of protein is about 0.8 to 1.2 grams. It's usually mainly 0.8, but if we want to say like somebody's older, the protein requirement is higher, if someone has cancer, it may be higher when they're going through treatment, and then that higher end would be 1.2 grams per kilo um, body weight. And when we go to that higher end, that's what we need for a 60 kilo person would be about 72 grams of protein, and the high fiber diet also meets that protein requirement. So it is possible on a fiber rich diet to get your protein. You just may need to plan it a little bit and get beans in as well. Um, and then when we think about animal or plant protein and which one do we favor, this is a study with over 131,000 participants that was published in JAMA, one of the top journals in 2016. And you can see, um, you know, the green arrow basically shows you um, whether the food group favors plant protein or it favors alternate st source, meaning animal protein. And then they've shown you each of the protein groups that they are comparing this to. And it's quite easy to see, but all the black boxes are towards the side which favors plant protein, suggesting that the risk of death is um, with replacement of 3% energy from various animal protein sources with plant protein is associated with um, a reduced risk of death as well. So this is a, you know, another question people ask often is, what about plant proteins? They are incomplete proteins. You don't get all your amino acids from it. What about that? And this is a really nice paper from one of the top nutrition scientists at Stanford, Dr. Gardner. And you can see here that all foods really have all amino acids. And some plant-based foods may have some of the amino acids in shorter, smaller amounts. But when you eat a variety of foods, this balances it out. And it doesn't have to be with every meal. As long as you are eating every week or in your life, a variety of grains and beans and lentils and other things, you're going to get all your amino acids. And then, you know, people ask like, okay, carbs are bad and should we avoid carbs? And what I say is actually carbs are very health promoting as long as they are complex carbs or whole grains. And you can again see here that whole grains are associated with even reduced cancer risk and uh, death as well around cancer. And this is some of this data is around uh, you know, colorectal cancer, but similarly, I showed you for MGUT, the risk is lower also with whole grains. And um, you, whole grains, the recommended requirement is about three servings per day. How many different plant foods do you eat in a week? I encourage you all to think about this carefully and maybe count this after the, uh, the webinar. Um, the reason I bring this up is this was a study with over 10,000 individuals. They collected stool samples and asked them about their dietary intake. And what they found was those who ate more than 30 kinds of plant foods per week. So they're talking about different plant foods, not just the same one. So um, if you're eating broccoli 30 times, that doesn't count. It's broccoli, uh, lentils. Um, quinoa and different types of lentils count as different, like if it's pinto bean, black bean, all of those things, and then different herbs and spices as well. As long as you get more than 30, you're, it's more likely that you have a more diverse gut microbiome as well, as well as less antibiotic resistance. So when I talk about all of this, people say, oh, are you telling everybody you should go vegan or uh, vegetarian? And what I want you to understand is that a vegan diet is based really on ethical and environmental reasons and concerns on how food affects animals and the environment. But it doesn't have to be healthy with, because you can eat a lot of like Oreos and French fries and still be vegan. 
but um, vegan can be very healthy if you are eating these high fiber plant based foods, of course. Vegetarian, often people are doing this because of ethical or religious reasons, but I have seen many vegetarians who focus their diet mainly on only eggs and dairy and are really not eating enough fiber or junk foods, fries and processed things. So that again can be, can be, they can be vegetarian, but that doesn't mean it's healthy. When I, what I'm talking about is getting most of your calories from unprocessed plant foods. And um, whether you are vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, Mediterranean, paleo, keto, low carb, I think if you can get 80% or 90% of your plant foods from unprocessed plant foods, you're going to have the health benefits of it. And what you can see in this figure here is the plate from um, the Canadian Food Guide. Half the plate is fruits and vegetables, a quarter is carbohydrates, and a quarter is protein, but it's mainly plant protein even in that figure. So um, understanding calorie density and calorie counting, what 500 calories look like. So if you're eating fruits and vegetables, 500 calories can really fill you up sometimes. But if you're eating very fried, processed foods, 500 calories are not going to fill you up and you're going to end up eating just more than you need to. And that's part of why when we had patients on the study eat to satiety, they're still able to maintain some degree of weight loss to come to a healthy BMI. A common question I get is what about organic foods and cancer risk? And this was a study looking at over 1,300 part can uh, over 60,000 participants, but 1,300 cancer cases. And they said that they showed that people who ate the highest quartile of organic foods were more likely to have less cancer by about 25 percent. But it's also important to understand here that you know um, these are also patients who are probably more likely to be eating healthy, avoiding other toxins, things like that too. So should you eat only organic foods because of that kind of a study? And this is a nice website that allows you to calculate what's the safe limit of fruits and vegetables. And what you can see is that a woman could consume over 400 strawberries, um, serving, servings of strawberries in one day without having any effect. Because, um, if, and only after that will the pesticide start being an issue. So we really, nobody's ever gonna consume that much and the same thing with spinach. So just to summarize it, this is what I think is that if one half of the US, pop, not what I think also this paper shows it, but if one half of the US population were to increase fruit and vegetable consumption just by one serving a day, an estimated 20,000 cancer cases might be avoided each year. And in contrast, the pesticide residues on these fruits and vegetables might only result in an additional maybe 10 cases per year. So it is important to get your fruits and veggies in whether they're organic or not. And sometimes people think that just because of this, they don't need to eat um, you know, plant foods, but I think it's very important. There's a lot of data you know, around vitamin D deficiency and myeloma risk and how it might lead to decreased overall survival in the top right corner, also associated with increased inflammation, uh, more neuropathy, maybe more plasma cells in the bone marrow, um, less progression-free survival. However, no study has yet shown that when you, you, you give vitamin D, um, not in myeloma, but in other situations, that this uh, improves um, outcomes for things. So I think we don't really know, but at this point, you know, I do see that some patients have extreme fatigue or things like that, and even taking these medications as bone strengtheners is important to have the vitamin D level up so that you can absorb calcium better because you can't absorb it if you don't have uh, good levels of vitamin D. So just important to know that it, nutrition should be individualized by disease stage. I don't think everybody has the bandwidth or at the time when they're just diagnosed to start making all these changes. And I think it's important to think about where in the disease the patient is. Are they um, empowered by this? And is do they think it's going to help them? And do they have side effects? And if they have side effects, maybe we need to really let them eat whatever because they're just not able to keep things down or do they have medical comorbidities? I think if anybody has any of these conditions such as lifestyle disorders like obesity, diabetes, cardiac disease, high cholesterol, there's much more reason to make these changes because you can really make that difference. And um, these are just some practical tips to consider based on all that I've talked to you. Try to get the three servings of whole grains, reduce the refined carbs, the sugary drinks, 
improve fruit and vegetable intake. The diversity is what matters. Try to get different plant foods in, eat more plant over animal sources of protein if possible. And then you want to get the fermented foods as well. Um, I didn't show you data, but fermented foods are associated with reduced inflammation. And fermented foods are things like um, kimchi, tempeh, um, pickles, yogurt, these are kombucha, these are some fermented foods. And then when you think about fats, you want them unsaturated fats mainly. And so calorie counting is hard to sustain and I've not seen more, many people be able to do this lifelong. And so it's more important to just plan meals in advance, preparation, regular meal times, and ensuring adequate hydration, making healthy swaps and thinking and prepping in advance. So sometimes making your food, putting it in the freezer um, so you have boxes ready, those are things that can sometimes help you make the right choice. Anybody, if they're super hungry and have nothing to eat, right in front of them are going to pick the fast food option, including me. So it's important, that's why, to you know plan ahead. And frozen fruits and vegetables are equally healthy. Um, so you know ba buying bags of frozen fruits, if you live somewhere where you can't buy fresh produce, there's no problem with buying the frozen or canned um, beans and things like that. They, are, they, they still have the nutritional value very similarly. So I encourage you all to maybe pick one goal at least to begin with from this list and things that we've talked about. And in the bottom right, I've shown you a plant uh, forward or a healthier burger version of maybe a food that you enjoy. And when I talk about eating more plant foods, I'm not talking about just eating salads all the time, but you can really take recipes you enjoy and create them with plan forward versions where you're maybe eating a burger, but instead of a hamburger, you're eating a bean burger. And maybe the bun, instead of it being um, a white bread, is a whole grain um, high fiber bun. So there are these tiny changes you can make and still enjoy the food that you like. Also important to look at food labels and think about, you know, um, you would think uh, nuts are healthy. So this honey toasted pecan is just about fine. But you can see here that the, the dietary fiber is only one gram and the sugars are 18 grams. So there's a lot of sugar in these honey toasted pecans and maybe something you want to avoid and instead maybe pick just pecans. Um, so with that, this is just one more slide on how National Kidney Foundation has guidelines on diet and kidney disease that you can look into. And then how the American Co Co College of Cardiology also has similar guidelines on healthy eating and traffic light and thinking about foods to minimize versus enjoy. So with that, I'd just like to also bring up, these are two surveys that we are currently running and we'd really appreciate you filling it out, the dietary pattern survey. If you do fill it out, you will also get a nutrition report sent to you after. So that's a bonus. Um, and um, we want you to fill it out before you've made changes, you know, not after you've listened to the stock and made changes. So it's more important like what you did before it. So with that, let's change our focus in myeloma from living longer to living better and longer and um, incorporating these lifestyle changes to reduce comorbidities and improve quality of life. And uh, just future directions, things that we really want to do and things I'm interested in is we need to find funding. But if we do, uh, we'd like to really do trials and intervention and observational trials around immune therapies, newly diagnosed and maintenance space and also bring this to other cancers. So with that, I'd like to thank, you know, um, patients who've taken part, funders who've really supported this work, as well as um, Dr. Um, Lisokin, Dr. Vandenbring, Usmani, Iyengar, Jun Mao, all of these who've helped and supported my work and allowed me to do this at MSK. And it, of course, is not an individual uh, effort. We have a huge team that we work together and it wouldn't be possible without them. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Shah. What amazing research and information you just shared with us. And it's now the time we've all been waiting for. Lots of great questions have been coming in. So those of you, if you have not yet put your question in, simply open the Q&A window and type in that question. And Dr. Shah, if you'd like to start looking at and reviewing some of these questions that have come in already. Sure. Um, so one of the questions was, is one immunocompromised if one is diagnosed with smoldering myeloma? 
Um, there could be slight immune compromise, and as it progresses, there might be increasing amount. But we do know that um, you know patients with MGUS have slight increased risk of infections, and so do smoldering. But that risk is small, so I wouldn't say that you know you should worry too much about it. But just try to live your healthiest life and work from there. Um, another question was, uh, should myeloma patients avoid coffee or caffeine? No, I don't think you need to avoid coffee. Coffee is actually associated with healthier microbiome changes. And uh, the thing is with coffee and tea and all of these things is what people end up putting in their coffee. So when you put things like the sugar and the um, um, you know, fat or the dairy and things, that is the what ends up making the coffee less healthy. But if you're really having the black coffee or you're having the coffee without sugar or tea without sugar, I think that would be fine. Um, and uh, it's also associated with some health benefits. Um, there's a question on um, mushrooms. Mushrooms are a very good source of vitamin D. Um, they're also um, asso associated with, like selenium is high in mushrooms. They're good with anti-cancer benefits too. So I really, I meaning I don't see a downside with mushrooms. I think if you like them, you should continue to eat them. Um, in terms of turmeric, so I showed you the slide on the Nutrivention 3 study we are um, doing just now. In that study, we are trying to understand um, how turmeric affects the gut microbiome and, and as well as affect the risk of progression to myeloma. There is one study that was done from Australia that maybe suggested some delay in progression, and there are a few case reports of this, but we don't really know for sure how much it helps patients and how the mechanisms are other than we know it has anti-inflammatory properties and maybe some positive microbiome changes. So um, the, the thing though with turmeric is what you basically use with cooking, and I encourage you to use that as a herb and spice with cooking. But uh, curcumin, which is the active ingredient in turmeric, is often what's in the supplements. And hopefully in the next few years, we'll have data for you. At this time, I don't recommend it to all patients because I don't think the data is strong enough. But some patients do take it because they feel like it helps them or they want to. So it's a personal decision and the cost benefit is something you need to think about. Um, I've not heard of spinach promoting myeloma, but I think spinach is a very healthy food. And, um, you know, just cooking it a little bit improves the absorbability and the digestion, digestion of it sometimes instead of eating it always raw. So, um, you know, having a spinach soup or a sauce with spinach, I think is very good. Um, I Somebody's saying um, that they had... Um, lost some weight due to diarrhea and whether that would mean worse outcomes. I don't think so. Um, I think, you know, again, everything needs to be individualized. Many patients on Revlimid tend to have diarrhea, uh, but I think it's important to understand what is causing that diarrhea and why are you having so much weight loss on the diarrhea? And it would be important to talk to your doctor because um, if, if you're losing so much weight that it's not sustainable, maybe the toxicity from the Revlimid is too much and it's not worth the benefit for you. And maybe um, that dose needs to be reduced or maybe a break needs to be given and also other causes of diarrhea need to be looked into. Um, alpha lipoic acid is an antioxidant that has been shown to be associated with improvement in neuropathy for some patients, but I'm not sure about data for myeloma specifically. And um, I don't know about, you know, in terms of red meat, is it safer to eat cooked versus rare? I think in terms of the risk of like bacteria or, um, you know, getting a GI infection, probably uh, cooked is better. In general, red and processed meat have been associated with increased risk of cancer, mainly GI cancers, and they're considered carcinogens based on um, guidelines from um, the, the um, um, I can't remember, but the, the guidelines are there that suggest that. So I think that's something I would always minimize and limit in your diet. Um, somebody said that they've read uh, it's best to reduce the intake of antioxidants, including foods during induction therapy. Um, 
I don't think that's true. I think, you know, if it's come, if you're taking antioxidant supplements, that may be something you might want to avoid by taking supplements. Sometimes it's a high dose that's not physiologic and that doesn't help. But when you're eating um, healthy foods, it comes along with a lot of other things and it's in doses that the body can handle. Um, So somebody asked about seafood, and in our study, we are focusing really on plant-based high-fiber foods. I think with seafood, um, th there are some seafood um, that are healthy and can be incorporated as part of a healthy diet, but we don't want patients in our study to be only focusing on seafood, but we want them to really focus on the high-fiber part of the diet. And um, I, I think that if there is... Now, with you know some of the contamination of microplastics and things like that, we have to be really careful about um, very high amounts of consumption of seafood with all of that um, in terms of that's the main issue I see with it. Do you recommend taking butyrate supplements? We don't have data on that. And I think that you know the supplement is going to only work at the time you take it and not after, if it did work. And I think it's much, much um, better to really just eat foods that improve the microbiome if possible. Um, probiotics, the, the same thing. I actually do not recommend probiotics to everybody because I showed you that um, slide where um, patients in melanoma or skin cancer actually with enough dietary fiber and probiotics had reduced survival compared to enough dietary fiber and probiotics. And that's because um, probiotics are maybe this is a hypothesis, but it could be that probiotics are reducing the diversity of the gut microbiome because they have only few bacterial strains in there. So I think it's more important to be really um, more general uh, with just eating uh, more probiotic rich foods instead of specifically probiotics. Some patients may take a probiotic during antibiotic therapy just to help restore the gut microbiome or things like that. And I think that may be okay. Um, I, I can't talk about which strains because there are just so many different strains. And, um, you know, it's important to, um, if you, there's not enough regulation around that. We are studying this in our new prevention to study. And maybe after that, we'll have more data. Um, after transplant, you know, there is the challenge of maintaining a healthy weight and also eating foods that are healthy. Often cooked foods compared to a raw food is going to allow you to eat more calories because um, it, like for instance, spinach, one cup of raw spinach versus cooked spinach, you're going to be able to eat way more spinach when it's cooked versus it's raw. So I think one thing to do is eating more cooked foods. Another thing could be is uh, eating a little bit more calorie dense foods such as nuts and seeds, snacking on nuts and seeds, which are more calorie dense if you're worried about weight loss, avocados, olive oil, things like that. Beans are a good source of, you know, protein, fiber, things like that. So those would be things to like focus on in your diet if you feel like um, weight loss is an issue. Um, Rochelle, maybe we can do one or two more questions. Sure. And then we can stop. Yeah, that sounds good. So um, they're all so good, right? <laughs> uh, do you have anyone or who you want me to talk about? I think you've hit on, on the biggest, hottest topics that I could see. Um, maybe I'll just talk about, I see some questions about participating in the studies. Um, you know, the QR code is there. You can fill out the form and that way somebody from our team will reach out to you. Alternatively, you can also email us and, um, if, you know, we will get back to you if you're eligible, but we really need to know one is if you're willing to come, if it's Nutrivention 3, are you willing to come to New York six times spread over a year? And if it's Nutrivention 2, uh, you would, should contact the Health Tree Foundation because the study should be up and running next week or maybe next month, very soon, actually. And we'd like smoldering myeloma patients participate in that. Oh, that's that's wonderful. So as we can see, Dr. Shah, your presentation and the number of questions that have come in, I mean, at, we're calculating them out and we're well, well over 50 questions here. So this topic is exciting. It's much needed. The research and the work is appreciated. So thank you and your entire team 
for what you're doing to help us live better and healthier lives, to learn more about how we can help ourselves through nutrition. So we're, we're just so appreciative of this information and we hope you continue to uh, bring it to us and we want to learn and hear more. So to all our participants tonight, thank you again. And we want to hear back from you. Your information is important. So at the end of this program, you'll see that little pop up that will come up on your screen. So please click continue to take that survey. We very much appreciate that. And again, don't forget, you'll be able to access tonight's slides plus the replay of the webinar. All you need to do is go to myloma.org and you'll be able to listen to this again. I think even when we listen two, three, four times, we're gonna to continue to learn from here. Uh, and, and of course, we are always so grateful for the educational support of the Living Well webinars. And tonight we specifically thank Bristol Myers Squibb Jansen and Cario Farm and Sanofi. And Dr. Shah, thank you again. And thank each of you for joining us tonight on this webinar. We appreciate your engagement and hope this helps you to live well with myeloma. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone.